I'll tell you why it's fitting that I do this interview, because um, I idolize this dude. I've been watching him from when he came on the scene, and um, he just blew us all away. When I say us, there's a bunch of folks out there who think and write and talk, et cetera. And then there are a subset of us that also grow some businesses. And this guy came along from a growing businesses perspective. So I don't know, I mean, look, you've, you've read this stuff. You know the Belarus hawking baseball card. <laughs> you know the wine guy. You know that shit, right? But let me tell you something. You could not find a smarter, more astute businessman um, who has, in the modern era, realized the tools that one uses to grow a business. So this isn't about social media when you really listen to him and talk to him. It's just about the way business is done today. In addition to that, he, he lives his brand. Um, look, he is an egomaniac, narcissist, fantastic guy. <laughs> <laughs> Who just kicks ass is the bottom line. So uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, and I'm I've been looking forward to it for, for quite a long time. Thank you, Keith. All right, with that in mind, um, the way I want to try to divide this up is into three parts. The first part is a short one to talk generally about content and storytelling and to talk a little bit about how one gets one message out there in the aggregate. But what's really powerful about this book, by the way, and you'll notice it's, it's just dog-eared to death and back, is the way, I mean, in the way that we consume media today, he created a book, which is so weirdly interesting and antithetical because this is an old media platform and he created and he used it in a new media way. You, you see story after story and every one embedded in that is like a little Hershey's kiss of a gift of a lesson to learn. And so I'm flipping through it and there's tons of stories. I don't want to lose the stories. So what we're going to do is we're going to start generally about content. Then we're going to go through each of the major platforms that every one of you should be understanding and using. And I'm going to throw out some stories. He's, he's going to tell you some of those stories real time. Right? So hopefully all of that will, will drive you right to the back of the room. Look, this guy doesn't need your money. Um, but you I'll better, take it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that's true. He will. But he doesn't need your money, but he, what we want to do is he wants to change the way you live your life. And so go buy the damn book, and we'll get back to that. All right, from a content perspective generally, um, I mean, this book, you know, jab, 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 right hook, is really about give, 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 then ask. And that's why I love the guy so much. It really is about how to be of service. How do you serve in life and in the social media world? Let me ask just generally about the, the jab, jab, jab philosophy. Um, and, and relative to telling stories online, are, are there any simple formulas associated with telling a great story? Or as you point out in this book, the story is is really tied to the platform and therefore it's different. But are there any uber concepts that people should think about first? Some level, first you have to know your story. I talk a lot about, I said something yesterday during the book, a book signing that really stuck with me and I don't say it often enough, which is if you're selling shit, there's nothing I can do for you, right? <laughs> My purpose is to get you as much exposure and awareness and attention as possible. That's the only thing I've ever tried to do for my business, myself, and the businesses I'm involved with. But they're really just at bats, right? They're just at bats to give you another chance to story tell. If you then are lucky enough to convert on your right hook and somebody buys your book or your wine or hires your service or buys your cell phone or whatever you sell, if that product is then not good, you're really in a troubled spot because now you're Hello? Now you're no longer in a place where what you did was you hunted well, but what really matters is farming, right? Retention, lifetime value, do you get a second sale? This book is gonna do much better for me, very honestly, than my others because it's better, and thus I've already seen the word of mouth. I mean, I watched my Amazon rank on Thank You Economy and now on Jab, 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 Ray Hook very carefully, and you know, Thank You Economy has the big lift because I'm good at promoting and I did my thing, but it slowly declined because I wasn't getting virality. To wake up this morning and see that it, it's gotten more sales, it's going down, means exactly what I thought would happen. Yes, I can show up on all the podcasts and do all the right things, but it's been everybody's word of mouth. And listen, and you said it, and so, uh, DJ just walked in and said, I mean, People are coming up to me and they like me. I have this. I have a lot of friends and I've done a good job in building relationships. People have found it very awkward to tell me what they really feel. This first week has been really fun for me. People are coming up to me and saying, you know, 
this is, you know, no disrespect, but I like this the most. Because, you know, all, all of them are like children. You know, I think at the end of the day, the first thing is you have to know your story. To know your story, I actually think every, you know, this is the biggest thing I hear all the time, which is what is my story? The funny thing is, I actually don't think that that's the real question. I actually, people, I actually think people know their story. I think people just don't have confidence in what they actually sell. You know, I, I think salespeople are the best, salespeople are the best people. I've never sold anything in my life that I haven't believed in. You know, that's why my wine show, for ones that know that background, did so well, because I panned so many of the products that I sold, which built so much trust, because I just was scared. Well, let, me, please, let me pause for a second please. on that. Because, I mean, one of the things I've noticed about you is that is, is clearly, as you can tell, his sense of passion. Right, he and I share that as friends, and but there are certain types of people who who seek to find the passion in things for themselves, and you do. I mean, you know, while you say you know you haven't sold anything you're not passionate about, you also really work to find the passion. And then in the same regard, I'm sure you've got to go to your, some of your clients and help them find the passion in their story. Take take a big company like GE and our mutual friend Beth Comstock. Um, maybe, maybe you can talk a little bit about how do you get a big company that actually wants to shift away from its consumer, I mean, if anybody thinks of GE, you think of, maybe you think of light bulbs, et cetera, but that's not even their business, right? So how do you get a big company to find passion in a story that they might not even find the passion in? They're different because of our mutual friend and she's pretty special. GE's the one client I have truly that from the day they hired us, let me do my thing, right? I mean, we, anybody who follows G on social networks, we put out Ryan Gosling, hey girl, meme content for GE. Think about that, right? I don't know if anybody followed what we did two days ago or yesterday, I'm getting lost now with my timing, but we did three, 3D printing day on December 3rd. Is today the fourth or fifth? Thank you. Uh, so two days ago on Twitter and on a lot of networks, we did 3D printing day. I mean, we came to them with that idea because 3D printing is a big meme, it's going on, they're passionate about it. We flipped and said, hey, December 3rd, let's make it a day, you can own it. It took us eight seconds for them to say yes yeah. on this big initiative that a lot of other companies will ponder. You know, the way I've been able to get companies, all the rest of them, to do what I think are smart things that will help them be more authentic, real stories, things that you guys actually care about, very honestly, has been brute force. It's been inappropriate conversations. I'm not joking. It's the fact that I have so much bravado, I was lucky enough that I was rich before I started this business. Which, this this is a real statement. Within the context of the companies you're trying to coach and cajole. This is what you're talking about. Which yes, you have to use. I have a company called VaynerMedia. We're a strategy and creative shop and we produce all the creative for social networks for major Fortune 500 companies. I'm talking Dove and Mountain Dew, GE, Green Mountain Coffee, very, very big brands. And the only reason we're able to get them to do good work against sheer my- Sheer force of will. Sheer luck of how this started. I don't need their money. I'm so obsessed with my own legacy. This is true. I'm, it's, for, it's far more interesting. Oh, he didn't say obsessed with his own self. He said his legacy, which is, which is the gift he's trying to give. So I wanted to qualify that. And I mean that. I'm, it's more important for me to be associated with work that changed the game and get credit for it. It's what I like. What, what I like doing for a living is being historically correct. So I'm not kidding. So here's the thing. We're about to go through a bunch of stuff that many of you are going to want to bring into your organizations. Many of you may not be in ultimate positions of authority to execute some of these things. Can I jump in right there? Please. That's a, the single thing I'm most fascinated by. I'm aware that the advice that I give is not practical to people that don't own their own companies. Let me say one piece of advice on that rant. If you are respectful with your feedback within your organizations or your clients and you don't waver and fold because you just want to make the sale or not get fired, if you do it respectfully and put it on the record, this will pay humongous dividends long term. Let me explain how it happens. By you fighting the board, your boss, you know, your boss's boss, and fighting I mean with a little bit of passion but respectful because from a practicality standpoint people don't want to get fired. But if you put it on the record consistently and never waver because you're just doing it to keep your job or get the client to pay you. What will happen is in two, three, four, five years, if you're so passionate and you feel like you have a good enough of track record of being historically correct about these things, what happens is in two or three or four years when you play out to be correct, 
what happens is you make so much more money because what happens is the people that leave that company that failed or get promoted within it, they remember that you were right and you become a much more important person within that organization. I have made far more money by leaving money on the table up front and then cashing in on it four to five years later because I was right about e-commerce becoming a big deal in 94 and 95. Because I was right about Google search and SEM being important. Because I was right that you, listen, I started my YouTube show nine months after YouTube launched. People made fun of me for it. They didn't think YouTube, YouTube was a fad if some of you remember, right? And so, and Twitter, and I was right about Tumblr, and on and on and on. And so, you know, I see where you're going with this navigation, it's important. I mean, this book is very much about how you can win online, no question. Let me use the same methodology for a moment to interpret as to how you can win uh, in a high touch world as well. Jab, 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 right hook means um, be generous, be generous, be generous. Do, Do everything you can do to make that boss of yours or that influencer successful. Make them the heroes as best as you can, right? And over time, you will earn the permission to influence. If you make other people successful in life, I mean, this is what we taught in Never Eat Alone. It's all about all great relationships give you permission for influence. But in order to get great relationships, nobody wants to be your friend. You've got to be deeply generous. So you bust your ass to be generous over an extended period of time and you will gain permission to put all of his stuff into practice. Right hook is bigger than jabs on this book. That is all correct, but I'm a little bit tired slash frustrated slash passionate about helping those people that are paying forward and doing the right thing to learn that there's an appropriate time to throw the right hook. That you have, you know, the best people, it comes natural to them to give Unfortunately, there's a subset of that that don't know how to ask or are crippled to go for the ask or are fearful to go for the ask. And without that ask, people will take advantage of just jabbing. It's true. You know, I, you know, and that's okay, by the way. I'll tell you why I can live this philosophy. Because I actually have zero expectation in return. And that's a very big variable to this whole thing. If you find yourself as a person who is often disappointed by others, this may not be your philosophy. This might not be the right philosophy for you. What really allows me to play this game is the fact that if I don't land the right hook, I'm actually not upset with that person, organization, or situation. Well, let me, let me try and that's to, not for everybody. Let me try to understand and make sure I, we got it right. Giving without keeping score, which is the words that, that I would typically use, um, doesn't mean to be a doormat, all right? So giving without keeping score means that's the approach, the mindset that you walk into a relationship or you walk in to giving. However, not asking and or letting people take without giving back is something that at some point you have to walk away from. So you've got to put the ask out, right, in order for you to be honored with the giving that you have. But here's the key, and this is my suggestion. Abandon the sense of resentment or abandon the sense of a balance sheet. Just walk away. And, it's, and some of you who are totally staying agree. there forever and just getting walked on is not the answer either. The other thing that I would say is try to make as many of your jabs not be siloed just to that relationship. Let them be a little bit more known because the person that you might be trying to land the right hook on, you might not be able to land on, but other people that have seen it, seen the jabs, might value that and give you opportunities elsewhere. So if you can make them a little bit more transparent and out there, there's a little more value with that as well. You know, what I want to do is, and I'll come back to some of, these, some of these more general topics later, but there's such a richness in the way this book is organized by very small vignettes and case studies. It's just fun to be leafing through and grabbing them. The pictures grab you, by the way, and they should do because they're supposed to grab you in a crowded media world, right? So if this book, it doesn't grab you as you open it up and leaf through it, it would have, it would have been at fault, but it isn't. It works. So what I want to do is I want to go by, by platform. Okay. One of the things that really hit me, and look, I, I, when I wrote Never Eat Alone, Facebook didn't even exist. Um, so we're rewriting Never Eat Alone for launch next year. So it's going to be Never Eat Alone 2.0 in the social media world. Um, the, the, and, I don't, and I am not an expert here. So I, I'm like a midget in this space. And I, that's probably politically incorrect. I'm sorry. I'm not a tall person. Um, <laughs> whatever it is. The, the, the point that I want to make is here, the big aha for me was the way you tell your story is gonna be different per platform. So let's march through the platforms. Okay, let's. I I, I wanna jump in if you don't mind. 
I believe that 95% of the people that are using social networks to drive any kind of business or life result are using Facebook and Twitter specifically, because that's where the most volume is, as distribution yeah. networks. We're treating Facebook and Twitter as a whole as email newsletters. We're just blasting. We're, we're putting out a tweet that has a link to something else instead of realizing that these platforms are places to tell stories within natively. You have to tell your story within the three seconds that somebody's going through their phone on Twitter and then, because you've successfully told your story there, that becomes the gateway to everything else. When you're just putting out a tweet saying, hey, I wrote an article about oranges and it's a link, you're not doing any value for anybody within that platform. Putting a picture within Twitter, within the size of a Twitter card that has an orange and maybe a quote from the article becomes a much more consumable piece. So you need to think almost like, yeah, you made a great movie, but if you don't make a great preview to that movie, you may not sell as many tickets to that movie. So and let's let, but let's split them important. down. Let's split down Facebook to Twitter because even within those two, I, until I read the book, I didn't realize some of that distinction. So if you're talking about Facebook, one of the things I learned here is you're really talking about engagement. A, a wonderful story. Talk about Air Canada. I love that one. And then, by the way, the picture was so so clear in here, but talk about Air Canada. Yeah, so it, with Air Canada, that was the the woman, right, who was a... a this, the, the I, did three, I did 447 case studies to get to 70. Got it. Four, nine months ago, so I'm a little bit wonky in this, but that, this was the woman that worked there for a trillion years, yeah, right? Yeah, and she just passed away, and it was, this they, was they did this a great was job. the post. They did a great job. They, they kind of talked about a, a woman who was a flight attendant and worked there forever, and or I'm not sure if she was a flight attendant, but she was there from the beginning, or, or she flew with them the whole time, help me yeah. here. No, this is, this is a woman. What's that? She first was a, flight She was the very Thank first, you. you want me to, I'm gonna tell the story. Thank you. All right? <laughs> I read the book, I read the book the <laughs> last 24 hours. Yeah. So, but by the way, I totally get this. If you ask me, some people will come up to me and say, I love, you know, that- On that page 47, what I love you like, did, I'm like, What are you fuck. talking about? I, <laughs> Right, so I mean, here, here was the lesson. Here was a story that was so powerful. Um, the, the oldest flight attendant just passed away, right, for Air Canada, and what a possible moving opportunity. But the text-heavy obituary, the, 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 the lack of a picture, right, just totally fell flat in terms of the opportunity what, that they what had. What they did on Facebook is what all of you do, which is they had a longer form article about it, so they put the link in Facebook, and as you know, if you manage your Facebook pages or ever work with it, if you put a link within your Facebook fan page, Facebook does a nice job and populates a picture, right, from the article, and that's all they did. And by the way, that's what 98% of people do, because Facebook does the work for you, and we're all worried about our time. See, what this really gets to is that we're all so worried about width, then we're not realizing all the action is in depth. And so that the extra 40 minutes that it would have taken to do a nice picture that would have actually worked on Facebook. Well, and, and look what Gary did. So Gary and his team, they went ahead and they actually redid the ad for them in the book. Going from one page to the other, it was just so obvious. And then I sit there and get embarrassed for myself because I realize that how many opportunities that if I had taken three minutes instead of 30 seconds, Right, I could have transformed the message in the story. And you're talking about for some when like you know if you have a fan page of fifty thousand or five million or whatever range you are, even if you have if you're a solopreneur here and you have a fan page of a hundred people, that's going to allow you to reach eighty people of your hundred instead of thirty two, and that's just all that matters, right? It's it's getting more. Cha- if you're going to take the effort to try to storytell, you might as well do it properly. Listen, I think. I think social networks right now are in a very funny spot. We're five to six years in, so it's mature enough now that people are actually putting effort and money into it. So now we start getting into the real questions of ROI. Is this really worth it? And what's really happening is these platforms are so different than anything that we've ever come from that I see, here's what I see. I see everybody starting to become cynical about a lot of these platforms when what I see is the tool's not broken, the mechanics are broken, right? That you know, the ROI of a piano for Keith and I is zero. The ROI of books for us has been phenomenal. The ROI of a piano for Elton John and Billy Joel was quite a bit. So the ROI is predicated on how you use the tool. You know, in theory, a basketball is broken to me as a money-making proposition. It wasn't for LeBron, right? So social networks work, but we are coming off. This is the single most important point that I did not make in the book. 
We are coming from a digital world where things were actually quite scalable and automated. Banner ads, search engine optimization, email marketing, these things actually were quite automated. Social, ironically, is very heavy human, very heavy touch, very long term. We came from sprinting and we're going to a marathon and most of us aren't trained for this marathon. I'm gonna come back and look, there's so many tips in here. I wanna keep coming, bringing him back to the stories which I will tell for him. Um, so the Katy, the Katy Perry story was a great one. I mean, here you are and you, you look here and there's, there's this wonderful picture of Katy Perry with a UNICEF t-shirt, right? She's jumping rope with some little girls. And then they just drowned you with bullshit facts, right? As opposed to his suggestion on how to, how to provoke somebody into wanting to know more, particularly a fan base of Katy Perry, wanting to know more about where she's spending her time. So what you don't give in that case. So in the other case, it was really understanding how to, how to emotionalize, using a picture and using the right headline, how to emotionalize your story and in the next story, it was how to provoke and not give too much that it ended up being boring and you weren't interested anymore from the headlines. Do you understand that? The and he really makes that distinction. The thing is, is when you're go, here's how we're consuming social networks. You have a third of a second to grab somebody's attention. When you write a ton of copy on your Facebook post, people tune out because the psychology of why they're there is to, using your term, eat popcorn, not a seven course meal. And so people are trying to apply seven course meals into a medium where you're supposed to snack on content. Right. We need to be selling gateway drugs on these platforms, not the real deal. That's a great one. And so now we're moving on from, from Facebook <laughs> on, on to Twitter, right? So. By the way, what he, what he just said is obviously a tweetable moment. I'm hoping all of you will. I would assume that this is one of the few speeches where you're allowed to have your cell, your, phone. your cell phones out, all right? And, and stupidly, by the way, I forgot mine at home this morning. I had to send my driver back to get it. And literally, on the way down, I was dialing in my quotes to the head of social media for our company. I'm like, get on the computer. I'm going to be calling you with my It's a funny thing to riff on. The morning. I would literally rather somebody roll up on me, stab me with a knife, and steal my wallet than lose my phone. <laughs> like, that's how valuable the phone has become, right? I mean, how many people here, real quick, by show of hands for fun, how many people here literally in every 24 hour window, including when you're sleeping, are always within arm's reach of their telephone. Look at that. Yeah. How it, many of you will develop some form of brain cancer within 24 to 25 years? By the way, that is, by the way, that literally is the number one thing I'm scared of. You know, I, I'm not even joking. Every day, literally once a week, I'm like, motherfucker, these are our cigarettes, right? You know how we sit now and make fun of everybody for cigarette right, smoking? That's your next tweet, motherfucker, these are our cigarettes. <laughs> I, really, I, I really think that these are our cigarettes. I have a bad feeling about all this. All right, well. Sorry. <laughs> just, just, just to bring the mood all the way down, you're all dying. The, the gateway drug, the gateway drug. All right, so let's move on to Twitter for a second. and. Now, I, I found this interesting. I mean, he, 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 and by the way, we're going to do a Q&A, and periodically I'm going to, actually, what, why the hell? Yeah, why not? Go ahead. Yeah. You talked about the ROI of a social uh, platform investment. Could you talk more about it? Because uh, every event I go to, uh, the major concern is, how much money do I put? What am I getting out of it? I was talking to this uh, VP at NBC Universal, and I own a creative agency, so we do a lot of analytics. So he's like, if you can solve this problem, I'll give you a deal. So I just wanted to get your yeah. thoughts. You know? So here, here's the first question I ask, and I deal with all those same clients, right? I ask them to show me the ROI of what they're spending their money on when they're not doing this. I mean, that's where this conversation becomes very valuable, right? Because unless you were a direct-to-consumer, DTR direct salesperson, and the reason we wanted to work with Green Mountain Coffee and the NFL, even though those were projects, not what I normally do, is I had a way to quantify sales. Right? And so even though, you know, when you talk to NBC Universal or, you know, I have TV clients and the KPI is Nielsen ratings. I mean, you have to really get concerned about that because I don't believe in Nielsen ratings to begin with. You've got 2,800 boxes representing 300 million people and like, you know, I mean, it's ludicrous. I mean, every one of my most analytical, every kid coming out of MIT, the hardest core data people in the world today, that you know, the real whiz kids of the next generation, they laugh because they didn't grow up with Nielsen's or IRI or all, they laugh 
at the quantifiable evidence of what success is in corporate America today. Literally to the point where I'm like, Am I, I should write a book called The Dark Ages, which is the last 80 years of marketing where people believe, I mean, Outdoor media is a multi-billion dollar industry that's predicated on men going on top of buildings, snapping how many cars drove by, and wrote a math amplifier to justify the ROI of billboards in a world where every person here, if they're not driving, is looking at their cell phone and are missing that impression. So, so the first way I do it is like, listen, I go in very guns blazing to that question. I say, great, show me every ROI that you've accepted because that's the real game. Unless you quantifiably take the link to, so some of you, if you really pay attention, might have seen IBM's last report this week that only 1% of Black Friday's sales came from social media. And everybody's like, oh, da, da, da. Meanwhile, they tested 17 sites, right? It's, the, they, the, all 17 of those companies suck at social media because they're using, the jet, they're throwing right hook, right hook, right hook, right hook, right hook, right hook, right hook. Of course it's not gonna convert. And number two, it's all based on last attribution. If you're gonna go with last attribution, well then we can't talk about marketing at all. There's no reason to do any marketing. So I get very serious about that. That's number one. Number two, the way I've been able to do it was, I, I don't know if any of you saw this, I was very fortunate, I had a very major profile in the New York Times three weeks ago, and I got double fortunate, for some reason my client Mondelez decided to disclose stuff that I would have never disclosed if I were them, because we're starting to see real results and nobody thinks there's real results, and I think that's a competitive advantage for the first couple of years, but they disclosed that on Nilla wafers, the Nilla crackers, that we did the work and they have a 9% increase on business this year. Like the real KPI, the real ROI. Not more impressions, not more good feelings, 9% increase in sales for a brand that hasn't grown in 10 years, okay? And here's where it gets interesting. We stumbled into it. We got $600,000 of their $900,000 marketing budget for the year. They don't support the brand. $900,000 for a brand of that size is ludicrous. They don't support it. The other 300,000 went to us when something broke. So what ended up happening was we had all $900,000 of the budget for the brand. Every dollar the brand spent that year, we spent on making creative on Facebook and Pinterest. And at the end of the year, 9% growth of sales. Period, no debate. So now, ironically, I'm actually going through Unilever and Pepsi and all my clients and asking them for small brands, not big brands, where they'll give us all the money because the easiest way for me to prove the ROI now is if you spend all your money with me, you're either gonna grow or not, and it's a, it's a very good way. So one of the things you may wanna do is silo something where they only spend money on a thing because then it becomes net-net that year, that's the ROI. If there's any question of the ROI, look at the guy to my left. Right, I mean, this was a, a family wine business proprietor. And look where he is today. And do you think that anything other than social media and his own tenacity, of course, but he used these tools and here you are. Here is an and, example and listen, of a man I, who, who is, his agency is now 300 people. I, so, I spent a lot of money on TV, print, radio, television, billboards to build up winelibrary.com and then with Wine Library TV, realize this Twitter, Facebook thing, let me just, you know, I'm always gonna, I'm the, if, I, if I was on the Christopher Columbus crew, I would have been the guy in that crew when we landed in America, that they said, look at this weird bush and that fruit. I'd be like, I'll eat it. You know, knowing that I would die or, or it would be good, that's in my DNA. I actually am baffled by people asking me questions like, but what's the risk of doing Snapchat and Pinterest? To me, it's always, my brain only works in one way. I'm like, the risk of not doing it is far greater than the risk of doing it. And until people realize that, they're gonna struggle. Obviously, this is a guy who believes, he's like the hair club for men, like he's also a client. So, um, over there on the left. It's true, it really is true. I, um, <clears throat> I work with independent filmmakers. Oh, by the way, I have a film coming out on, on uh, brain cancer associated with cell phones. Fuck. <laughs> but uh, in, in sort of carrying on is the conversation. Is it, are we finished? We are. Okay. <laughs> I knew it, I knew it. Just, uh, just don't keep it on your body. As long as it's arm, arm's distance away, you're good. But uh, <laughs> Great. <laughs> the, the question is, is, when you talk about Nilla wafers and you- The amount of testicular cancer in this room right now. Get it out of your pocket. <laughs> right? 
is uh, you talk about sort of the conversion, you increase sales 9%. And uh, was there something in particular other than, because so much about uh, converting, right, is not just exposure, but it's creating a relationship and sort of a desire to increase, you know, to that, actually get somebody to convert. That is, that's jabbing. That's actually providing value and then actually asking for the sale. Like, if I'm, if I'm marketing a film, I'm spending nine, as you're pro- making the film, I'm storytelling, I'm making animated GIFs every day on Tumblr around your film. The stuff that you may even edit out. And I'm storytelling on these platforms daily, just giving out stuff. I'm doing a Spreecast or a Ustream or a Google Hangout with the actors or doctors or whoever you have in the film months before the film comes out. You know how to sell a book? Sell it for nine months before it comes out. Yeah. And then it actually sells. Not, okay, my book's out, now it's time to sell. Game's over, you don't have enough time. So same thing with a film. For as long as you're, the future of film marketing is as you're filming it, you're storytelling on these platforms, and then when the film comes out, you've actually built a community, and you come out and say, buy the tickets. Like, the one thing I really preach in this book is not being half pregnant with your ask. You know, literally, my posts right now on social networks are, buy my book. Link, direct right hook. I feel that I've jabbed enough to have the permission to say that. And so, to me, you know, thinking about your world, it's about making these pieces of content day in and day out. You know, it's funny that I use the movie preview. You take it to the extreme. I mean, you know, depending on who you want to see this, things like Snapchat. I'm jumping a little bit here, but I want people to understand. Right now, Nate, are you done yet? Did you send it? So Snapchat. I think is seriously the most interesting marketing platform right now. Most people reading headlines think it's a bunch of kids sending naked selfies to each other. Ludicrous, uh, probably, but still. (laughs) Here's the real action. You know what Snapchat does? It, It fixes the one thing that actually matters, attention. Because the picture comes to you and you know that you can only hold it down for 10 seconds and then it disappears, you're actually paying attention for those 10 seconds. So right now, I just took a snap before we went out here and I sent out a uh, you know, snap and the reason Nate has and I asked him if he sent it is Snapchat's so new that you can't send a snap to everybody. So Nate, how long did it take you? 15 minutes. So literally for 15 minutes, poor Nate has been hitting every person that follows me on Snapchat to send the snap to. So it's ludicrous, this product's so new that it doesn't even make it easy to do this. You know, 15 minutes we hit everybody and then it sends out, but people are actually gonna pay attention to it and then they're gonna tweet, which is what I asked them to do. And I've been able to make things trend on Twitter for the first time in four years because I've asked people to use a hashtag from Snap because even though I only have 5,000 people there, 4,000 are actually gonna open it and pay attention to it, which is far greater than the million people that follow me on Twitter when I push something out. With all the noise that's on Twitter, maybe 480 will see it this time. 720 the next time. It's not about top line, it's about depth. That sounds exhausting. I, I mean, I recognize, I mean, my challenge as, a, as an entrepreneur myself. Everything is, great is exhausting. Is how much time should these folks be spending or they're or waiting until that shit. they fit fix their stuff. Waiting until it's clearer. Like how much time you you make All a it. livelihood. This hair club for men thing. I'll steal and give you credit to build your brand. I mean, I, I eat. I say I eat my own dog food. You know, the reason I'm good at this stuff is because I do it first. When Vine came out, I have a. At that point, my company's probably 180 people of the best marketing. You know, all that stuff. I have great people. Vine comes out in late. January, three, two, three weeks after Vine comes out, I am by far the expert on Vine yeah. in my organization. You know I mean, why? Jeff Comstock was bragging on that day that here we are, General Electric, not, per, not perceived as a you know, avant-garde social media company, but it is, um, had the very first video out there on Vine because of you. And so the other interesting part is, here's how I became the leader within my organization on Vine. Every night, of the first three weeks of February, from 11 p.m. to three in the morning, I played with Vine. I used it. I made videos, I watched what everybody else was doing, I paid attention to the nuances, I used it. You know, the amount of people that have have debates about the ROI of these things. I sit in a room and they're like, I'm like, listen, Instagram is the single most important social network right now. This is the advice I'm giving to my staff. Now, it's a little bit difficult for internet marketers because it's purely a print play. You can't link out of Instagram. So it's difficult 
talk about justifying the ROI, it's print. It's print. It's like running an ad in Vogue or Sports Illustrated. That's all it is. You can't do anything else with it. It stays within the confines. But the amount of feedback that I get from clients or other experts or taste makers or people that have points of view on Instagram's ROI, and then I ask the funny question, which is, do you use it? And half of them don't even have an Instagram account, but surely have a big opinion about it. And to me, that's what the rubber so de- hits the de- road. Definitely worth the billion Facebook paid for it? I said it at the time. Uh, you know, I predicted that Facebook would buy Instagram on a show that I was doing called The Daily, that old app, and so CNN had me on the day it happened because I predicted it, and I thought they stole it. You go watch the comments that day on Twitter, I'm an idiot, I'm an idiot. That was such a, a billion dollar, I mean, think about how you felt when you heard a billion dollars for Instagram, right? It was only 551 days old, right? but I knew that they needed to control the next generation of photo users, which is why I believed in it. That is a, they, they stole Instagram, stole it. So how, artist, how do you be artistic on it? I mean, Instagram is a unique artistic sensibility. Right? I'm not great at it. That's a whole other thing, right? I use everything, but there's certain things, you guys know, I'm great at Twitter because it's basically conversational and I'm good with people. You know, I'm good at video, which is why YouTube worked for me, but Instagram, I grew up in a family, there's six pictures of me. But, but tell, them, tell them what kind of an ethic it is. And some of them might not even know how artistic it is and what you need to do there. I will in a second, but this is even funnier. <laughs> From the ages of six to 16, I think there's six pictures of me ever. My family did not grow up taking pictures. In the Soviet Union, where my family's from, you didn't take pictures. And the ones that were taken, I have 700 pictures of the old country and my family, not one person smiling in a picture. It was a very depressing place. Anyway, you know, it can be a lot of things. Instagram is artistic. For uh, the reason it works is a lot of people like taking photos. Photos are a very big part of our culture. You can go with a lot of things on Instagram. Instagram, one, because it makes you better at taking pictures. You know, you start adding filters, your picture looks a little bit better. Instagram's a utility that became a network. It made you better at something that we cared about. But the bottom line, if you're gonna take a picture on Instagram, instead of going here, hold it down there and take it up the nostril, something. Just, it's gotta be interesting. You've gotta play with your, and that's one of the things the book did for me. It made me realize that every time I use a different social media platform, I've got to adapt to it. And I wanna go to Twitter for a second. Um, I'm just gonna jump in real quick, because there's a point I really wanna make. The reason Instagram won is the same reason I think this book's gonna win for me. Instagram made you better at taking photos. This is the first time I wrote a book to try to make you better at this stuff instead of tell you why it's important. And I can tell you right now that if you reverse engineer that, listen, when I wrote this book, I read every negative review of my last two books on Amazon twice. And the only things that happened were he tells you why. He's spilling his POV. It's a talker. And I'm like, okay, I respect that. And so knowing that I've built my businesses by doing, I fi- that's why I went here and I can tell you right now that if you take a step back and whatever you do for a living, if you can make your users, whether you're B2B or B2C, if you can make them better, you will win. We're going into a very major place of utility right now. People are valuing utility very heavily because time has become the asset. Time has exploded in value because we live in a 24 seven world now. We used to all, remember when we used to be able to, I mean, luckily there's not that many kids in the crowd. Remember when we used to be able to go home and your other part of your life went on? Now because of cell phones, I mean you send me an email at 9.30, my clients or my friends or my associates or my coworkers, they send me an email at 9.30 p.m. They expect a response. There's a different expectation. So in a 24-7 world, which is what we now play in, time is the asset that we value more than anything. The lady in the white, you had a question earlier? Yeah. Thank you. Um, You sort of disdain the folks who are not actually using the social media they're talking about their ROI on. Well, what if your decision makers or your consumers aren't aren't using that social media either? Well, then you shouldn't be there. (laughs) But my belief is that that is not true. I do not believe there's, between Facebook from from an age standpoint and LinkedIn from a B2B standpoint, I do not believe that, you know, outside of, here's a good one, I helped a nursing home as a, because it was a friend of a friend, not for VaynerMedia, not for me, not for a case study. Just a couple pieces of advice. They're like, listen, our clients are 80 to you know, 90 years old, right? I'm like, they're not. 
their kids are your actual client. There's plenty of 40, 50, and 60 year olds on Facebook and when they started making content for them, they started converting and so here's another one. If you look at the dynamics, here's why I like Snapchat, Vine, and Instagram to sell to 40 year old women even though they're not there. If you look at the data right now, 40 to 50 year old women that have daughters that are between the age of eight and 16, the eight to 16 year old is affecting their mother's buying habits so much more than 10 or 20 years ago where it was the other way around because we're living through the youthification of our society. If you look at the habits, the way they dress, the way they act, what they do day in and day out, the average 45 year old woman today is acting more similar to a 27 year old woman only 20 years ago. That if you sit right now, men and female, and you think about what your parent looked like when they were your age right this minute, you know, I mean, people thought they were done only two or three generations ago at 50, 60, 70, right? Now we're so lucky we're living longer, we're taking better care of ourselves, and we're living through this massive youthification, right? The, you know, the cougar movement that was so fun to make jokes about is a very real thing. And so, I, we have, listen, we have Dove, we have other brands, we're marketing to 15 year old girls to make their moms buy something. Because if their daughter thinks it's cool, their mom will buy it. And so, I don't know what you do. So, legal services is a great example of being in the content business. So let me explain where I'll go with you on this. Legal services. I'm gonna give you an example of Guinness Beer. Guinness Beer had a problem about 60 years ago. They had pub sales decline in the UK for the first time ever. And they're like, what are we gonna do? They went and did old school market research and surveyed people in bars. And they found out the two biggest things that people talked about were soccer and trivia. So they created the Guinness Book of World Records. So I don't know how many of you know that. I didn't know this until even a year ago. But I'm just curious. How many people had no idea that Guinness Beer started Guinness Book of World Records? So what they did was they started a media company to solve their problem. I would tell you in legal services that if you're, if you're focused on a certain genre, that in this book, and I spend a little time on it, it's a whole nother book and a genre, I believe, I'm gonna make a pretty big statement that I want everybody to wrap their head around. I believe every person in this room right now and the organizations that you're involved in, whether business-wise, NGO, whatever you do, every one of you and it are in the media business. I now believe that you're in the media business comma legal services. I'm in the media business, comma agency, comma wine. It's why I started my wine show. So I actually think what you need to seriously consider in this world is to become a media company. Meaning, put out content, long form, around not necessarily legal, but the kind of things that interest the people that you're trying to court. And then in a buzzfeed.com way where you have no ads, but every fifth post is is a native ad, Think of it as advertorial 2.0. Think about you, this is very rogue, so I know it's gonna be tough to digest, but I wanna pitch you something. Think about you starting a golf website, right? Literally covering golf, competing against Golf Digest, and that every seventh post was promoting your business. I actually believe that that is going to be a blueprint of people doing business. That they're gonna start creating media and content around the interest of the target that they're trying to recruit for their business. Over here to the left, the question. And I know it's left field, but I can see, you know, it's, it's, it's listen, I, I just wanna stick on this because it's such a big point and I think it's the next decade. The thought that we have to be in the media business because the cost of entry is zero. And not truly zero, but in comparison to starting Golf Digest or the Golf Network by putting a golfdaily.com on WordPress and then producing micro content to drive traffic, the cost of entry is so low. Thus, getting those use, so it gets, it's a very interesting thing. I've been testing it, it's remarkable. And we're launching our first ever, we have a cracker and we're launching the leading cheese review site of the internet in March and we're gonna, be, by building that, it's gonna be a gateway to the cracker and we don't necessarily want them to match the cracker and the cheese, it's just that we wanna elevate the brand equity of the cracker and by doing it with high-end cheese, it will do that for us. But that's the kind of stuff, and that's owning the media instead of buying banner ads on the media. He mentioned something in passing that the book does well. 
which just talks about not only the big content, but the micro content, how important that is. That's the jab, jab, jab. The ability to just be out there is a great, I'll let you find it yourself, the great uh, Oreo tweet for the Super Bowl uh, blackout, which is a, something you should look for in the book. Yep. So you talk about depth instead of width, but obviously with so many networks there is width. The human capital obviously is harder to scale than automating email marketing. Impossibly so difficult. So if you get, a, you, know, you get a new client, Dove or whatever, how many people are on that account? Like how many hours per week? It just Enormous, 11 you know, times 50, you know, 600 hours a week. I mean, real time now, and no, and people that's Dove, aren't. right? We're not all Dove. I mean, and all, the, and by the way, the time, so you're right, the time, you have to put in the time. But let me just make it clear, this is like exercise. You're gonna get the results of the time you put in. I know what it takes to get like chest muscles and pecs and muscle. I don't have them because I haven't put in the time. So you don't have to do this, but the only way to get results in this is to actually do it. Now the good thing is, when you're building a personal brand like Keith and I have and other people have, it really sucks because you actually have to do it. When you're a logo, you can build a team, have interns, have other people. I mean, retailers drive me crazy. They're like, we don't have the bandwidth. I'm like, meanwhile, you have 7,000 employees in your stores doing nothing at the register for 4,000 hours a week. If you just gave them a computer to do something, I mean, the, what I call sawdust, right? Everybody tells me we have no budget. I'm like, you have 29,000 fucking employees. I'm like, we can find budget, right? So, you know, I, I think, it, the number one thing I would say, the number one thing I would say if you're a solopreneur or small business is audit what you're doing. Literally look at every dollar and every hour that you spend. I promise you, if you cut the bottom 10% of what I call dumb shit, money that you've spent, because you've always spent it. You always went to that trade show every year, so you go again, but it doesn't bring you the value that it did 15 years ago. You always do this thing, that thing, the next thing. Anyway, if you cut the bottom 10% of what you do, and you take that money and time, and you produce content, and bring value to the actual end user, or potential end user of your business, you will get better ROI. Gary asked me a question in the, in the back. How much time do you spend promoting yourself versus promoting Ferrazzi Greenlight? And I said, that's a great question because I think there are many people in this room that have similar questions relative to the personality of an individual themselves versus their business on social media and where you go back and forth. Um, one big company I know, it's a, uh, uh, an insurance firm whose CEO is notorious for being an incredibly avid uh, tweeter. And as a result, he actually says a lot of really Dumb now, shit. Yeah, exactly. And the, the, his organization is constantly saying, take that phone back. No, not in a board meeting, because you're going to say stuff you shouldn't, right? Take that phone back. So that's one end of the extreme. On the other end of the extreme, you know, an organization like ours where we're struggling. I mean, nobody gives a damn about Ferrazzi Greenlight, but the personality of Keith Ferrazzi is a little bit more interesting. Of course. Do you have any comments on that relative to individuals, many who may be smaller entrepreneurs looking at that balance. It's about storytelling what value proposition. Ferrazzi Greenlight though has enormous depth of information and the fact that Ferrazzi Greenlight does not put out an infographic every week of some information of lightweight content that can go quite viral, especially if you think about the female demo on Pinterest, Pinterest infographics is just gold. And so if you actually make the infographic with the Pinterest female demo in mind, you can Great, great results. And so, in a world of, you know, listen, I'm six of my last 11, six of my last 10 uh, investments are in female entrepreneurs, right? Seven of the 11 leaders in my company are female, right? We're living through an incredible time where EQ is becoming more valuable than IQ, which just by generalization lends itself to going towards the female side. Luckily, I'm quite girly, so I'm good. But, <laughs> you know, I think you could put out tremendous. Something tells me this audience wouldn't necessarily concur that the person out there in front of them is particularly. If they dug deep, they'd realize I am. And so, what I think, what I think is interesting is you could crush putting out infographics. And so, it's about storytelling what you can actually bring to the table. There's uniquely things that you can do. There's uniquely things that I can do. But there's definitely unique things that our organizations can do. I mean, listen, I could have not wrote jab 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 right hook without VaynerMedia because I did so much of this work at scale and I had a team that helped me go through thousands of case studies to get down to 500, which then I worked up. It just wouldn't have happened, right? And that's why it's deeper because it's not just me anymore with my intuition. It's actually granular with the work. That's where you have a shot. The lady at the top. Yes. 
way down. We'll sh sh shout, if you want to just shout it out, we'll repeat it. I, I can kill the, the white noise here. And so that, that's what it's about. It's about figuring out what you do best as an organization and then storytelling that in the proper channels, contextually to the channels. So an infographic works, but then you could also do an animated GIF with a quote from you mm. that lends itself to a report. Um, I have an entry in the global startup battle uh, and I'm trying to get votes without buying them. I need a thousand in the next two days. Is there anything I can do? So this comes back to how do you sell a book? You do it for nine months before it comes out. We had a week. <laughs> yeah, but you didn't really have a week. You've had your whole life. And so, you know, to me, to me the answer is social, yes, but not social media. I would tell you to look at things like Outbrain, where you can buy distribution. I mean, if you're, are you talking about spending money? Without. No, 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 we can't. You can't, you're not allowed to. You know, not, you know, not from a, I don't know, in a week? Nothing, uh, nothing I talk about could do well, that. Well, that's not true. You, you pick your 30 actual friends. So in the same regard, you might not have built the following, but hopefully you've built the network, the relationships. So go call and lean on heavily a group of individuals that have some extension. That was the first thing you did. You already did that. Of course, okay. if, like any contest, that, 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 that's why I said nothing, because well, let me, let me I just, just know, without you, even asking, I knew that was her first move. Did you actually do the ask? It's, I, there's nothing more frustrating to me than when you do this broadcast email to all your network and you say, will you help me? And nobody does, because they don't know that you are and you're not. Up on the other hand, you actually pick up the phone, you well, call each of exactly them, right. and work through the process of what they need to do, and then ask them if they wouldn't mind reporting what they did. Yeah. You might actually get some better results. Yeah, I did that for about 10 people, but I could, Keep going. That's yeah, the only thing you got. To, you know, At this stage, look, for both of this, whether it's personal relationships in the real world or whether it's what you're building as a following in fans, it's build it before you need it. Over and, here and, to the and, left. and I'm gonna just jump on that a little bit. Really go for the right hook. Like of those 10 yeah. people, go look. I'm, listen, I did this for my new book. I have so many friends and contemporaries and acquaintances that write books or have Kickstarters Who and they, say, and they oh, blast an email right. and I don't feel personal with that. I'm like, they sent it to everybody. So I literally emailed one by one Talk about, it sounds hard. Uh, the email was contextual. Hey, how's Sally? Hey, saw you at the Padres game. I mean, it worked. Like 11 minutes per one email, or four minutes per, and they converted, and then I got real gangster because I'm so obsessed with this book. I'm going back now and being like, hey Carl, you didn't buy or blog or talk about my book. And then I come back two weeks later and be like, Carl. <laughs> so of those, ten, of those 10 people, did four of them do it? Did seven of them do it? Did all 10, and if all 10 didn't, go back to those two and be like, I wasn't joking, this is, my, this is one of my asks that I'm gonna have in my life. That's, that's, the, that's the jab, 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 ask, and you really are allowed to do that. Over here. Um, my question is about sort of the sensational, emotional content that works so well, but how do you leverage that and still be genuine and still? You mean hyperbole content? Well, I mean, Air Canada, you know, that's somebody's okay. life. That's a woman, that's a female. You think they exposed her? You know, certainly brands do, right? I mean, there's times where you see things and you're, you're just like, man, what is that? How, do, how does that? And it makes you feel you weird. You know what the worst is? For everybody that follows us, we'll donate a dollar to the Haiti oh. Relief Fund. I want to kill people. Right. Like, I'm like, you're a billion dollar company. Just give money to the Relief Fund. You're taking a disaster to try to get more followers, you piece of shit. Totally. So, so my, yeah. I hate that. So, you know, I guess my question is, and I'm not doing a good job asking this question, but how do, how do you use that in the right way? How By do you doing it the right way. Genuinely. You know, like, when you retweet, I picked on Holiday Inn in this book, that's a case study I remember, <laughs> for retweeting, like, every tweet is a retweet of somebody saying they had a good time at Holiday Inn. You know what that's called? Bragging. No, no, your other followers don't want you to just talk about how great you are. The funny thing is, and again, I truly believe the reason that I over-indexed on social networks is because I think social networks actually look a whole lot like becoming rich. When you become rich and famous, you don't change. You just become the extreme version of what you are. I get so much credit for being a nice guy. Last night I had a book party and I stood in one spot for four and a half hours and just took pictures and answered people's questions and just 
blogs and articles and tweets of how great of a guy I am. I'm like, that's common courtesy. I'm so lucky that people want to take a picture with me. So I think social networks are just accelerating and exposing and extremalizing who we actually are. So how do you actually do it? By doing it the right way. By actually acting human. Everybody thinks on Twitter to win, you've gotta be funny or witty so you get retweets. How about being nice or listening or bringing value? I mean, there's a lot of attractive variables. I I tell people all the time and my clients, I'm like, the way to win on social networks is the same way that ugly dudes get beautiful women, right? You have to have other attributes. You're not good looking, (laughs) you know? You're, you're a brand, right? You're a brand. Nobody wants to hear from you, oil company. So how do you win? Say, do good things. Be funny. Be, you know, be, be. I, I did a blog post about sending flowers on July 12th. I'm obsessed with this notion. If I got, if I bought flowers for my wife on Valentine's Day, I would get some sort of value proposition, meaning. Not like the ha 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 value proposition, the meaning I get credit for doing the right thing, it feels nice. If I buy her flowers on July 12th out of nowhere, the value of that same exact action is 8,000 times more valuable, right? Those are the things we have to do. We have to bring value in a lot of different ways. So the answer to your question is quite basic. It's how do you do it? You just do it the way you would do it in real life. What brings value? And that's why I think we've had a lot of success. We're doing, we're, for, I'm forcing these brands to act human. How do you, do, do really quick on Twitter for a second, you're so, you're such a savant there. Uh, hashtags, um, can you give some advice on yes. how people should be using them? Everybody wants their hashtag to trend. Let me, let me, let, let me save you a lot of time. Your hashtag's not gonna trend. Unless you're a 15 year old rapper, your hashtag is not gonna trend, okay? So, what I say with hashtags is look at the hashtags that are trending at that moment and try to figure out how to say what you wanted to say by using one of them, yeah. right? That, that is a huge secret that I've talked about in this book that I've already seen people use and are getting so much, but you have to be a creative writer, right? If you wanna sell your law service and you see all these funny slang things trending, if it's, how do you make Cyber Monday fit your thing? You know, you know for me, it, you know, we did it for Wine Library, it crushed, it said, take a second from stop clicking on Cyber Monday and drink a Pinot Grigio, killed. You know, we, we wanted to talk about Pinot Grigio, but we used what was trending at that moment, right? And there's always things trending, like my first kiss. How do you make that work for what you're selling? Having the chops to be creative enough to come up with copy that lets you sell what you're selling or bring value to people while using a thing that's trending that's not exactly what you're doing is a real skill. It's like breaking news versus making a long form movie, right? I tell all my creatives in my organization, I tell them, you're in the breaking news business. At Ogilvy and Wyden and Kennedy and all these other places you guys came from, you were in the filmmaking business. It was very romantic, so you were draft, creative. Draft off the pre-existing hashtag. You're now in the president's been okay. shot, how are you gonna go on the air? Here, here's where we're gonna go. We're gonna left over there, lady here. Sorry bud, you've already had one question. Uh, and the guy up there. Gary, so I have been a chef uh, and event manager for more than two decades. And the philosophy has been you're only as good as your last event, you're only as good as your last meal. You have been the seminal figure in deconstructing that, so thank you. Um, you. Now in the social media realm, can you speak to that of not letting the perfect be your enemy and just... I, I, I think the imperfect, so first of all, I think intent trumps all. And I think the second you really understand what I just said, you become far more you know, lucid in your communication. I'm never scared to doing the wrong thing, tweeting the wrong thing, promoting too much, because I'll apologize if I really feel like I was wrong. I actually consulted one of my clients to do something wrong on purpose so we could say we're sorry because I think the sorry is more valuable than the status quo. I mean, it's crazy. So to, the reason I'm not crippled by perfection or it has to be perfect or anything of that nature, as a matter of fact, the one thing I've been most scared about with this book coming out is people critiquing what I'm putting out content-wise Against your own speed. Against my own speed, because what I'm doing is I'm still testing. So I'm still putting out links that auto-populate the pictures on Facebook, because I'm always testing, and I'm like, oh man, this is gonna be tough to explain, because somebody's gonna jump in and be like, Gary Vee, you just you know, wrote a book about, you gotta make a picture, why are you doing this? And so, uh, you know, 
I'm never crippled by it because intent matters because when I reply to that person and say, listen, I'm still testing baseline because Facebook's always changing, they're like, oh, there's like more value for me to continue the smarts than me being crippled by doing the wrong thing. So I think it's quite simple. I think that if you're willing to respect your, your, your haters or the people that don't agree or the people that are upset with your last meal, as long as you're willing to respect them and have true dialogue, you can't lose. Unfortunately, some of us don't start out having a lot of money. Yep. And I actually, I have a website that I created that on Facebook, it went viral in 2010, has about 300,000 people on there. That's great. The thing is Mm -hmm. that as, uh, you know, I started working on monetizing it and all this, and then Timeline came along. Right. And then they started trying to charge for views. I used to get automatically 160,000 people would see everything I did. And now? Now sometimes there's a post that I will do, and I'm, I, I've worked to be good at this, yep. where 2,000 people will see it out of 300,000 people. And it doesn't even make sense when it says on the bottom, and it makes it very frustrating because yep. as I'm trying to build this and I'm trying to grow it, yep. I'm right now the poorest person to be featured in Forbes twice last year. Yep. So uh, I really, you By know. By the way, you need to wear that t-shirt. <laughs> make that I know, t-shirt this is like, my that. friends. Wear that t-shirt and make that t-shirt and wear that. My, f- so my friends actually introduced me, me that way. She's the poorest person to be featured in Forbes. Let me explain to you yes, a couple please. things. Number one, we're, we're getting a little technical now. Facebook doesn't let every person that follows you see the picture or post that you're putting out there. It's actually the best thing they did. Let me explain why. Everybody wants to look at it as like they're trying to get my money to boost my posts, which is true. On the flip side, open rates on email in the last eight years have gone from 37% to 12% on email newsletters because marketers ruin everything. If Facebook allowed every person that they follow their fan page up and their friends to show up in their feed, they would have the problem that Twitter has now and email has now, which is there's so much noise, nobody's consuming anything. So what they're doing, whether they're doing it effectively for your specific page or mine, what they're trying to do is use people's actions to require what they show up in their feed so that the product, the only asset Facebook has is the actual user. And so they're trying to make it best for them and their belief, and I believe this to be true, is that we need to populate the things that they believe algorithmically are the most important thing. Where you, where you needed to make a move and where you need to make a move now is, and what I did when I started seeing that happening as well, is you can never, never, be behold to just one platform. So when I started seeing that same thing in 2012, I'm like, wait a minute, they're starting to really play here? And I get it, I really do. I really do believe they're doing the right thing, I truly do. I started making all my pictures, used my Instagram account to start siphoning people to Instagram. I started putting my Pinterest pins in there. I started asking, you should do a post every week that asks people to follow you on your other platforms. You need to spread it out so you're not, be- now I mean, there's a lot of people I'm sorry, I, I gotta go to the gentleman. You guys should chat before I leave. while you're buying give you more stuff. books to give yeah. you or your friends. Hey Gary, how's it going, man? Good man, how are you? Good, um, so my name is Vincent and I, uh, I run a company that's a two-choice voting platform okay. uh, with photos, videos, music. And the question that I have for you today is like, we, we get some traction with like millennial kids and we signed a boy band. Um, and so like the kids have taken over the platform and are really using it and asking lots of questions about the, you know, the, the band and stuff like that. The question that I have is like, how 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 do we take a um, how do we leverage the fans that are uh, like on uh, about this particular band and try to turn it into, you know, them asking questions uh, about the other stuff that's happening on the site? Does that make sense? Like, yeah, and I think the answer is you don't. You don't. You just what 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 you're trying to do is say, oh, we have all these users that ask about this boy band. If we can get them to ask questions about other things, we'll have a bigger network, right? The problem is the more you try to force them to do something they don't want to do, the less likely they'll come back at all. And so what you need to do is create more parallel paths of interest and replicate what happened with the boy band with a chef, with you know wine guy, with an op. Like you, you can't take a group that's interested in something and make them interested in other subject matter. They're not yours to make interest. They're borrowing you. Got it? They're not yours. I, I love when all my startups think that they're their users. They're not their users. They're, your product is theirs to borrow. 
And so you have to respect them. And so what you're doing is such a classic mistake in mentality of, okay, we've got this, now let's take these people and make it good for us by making them do other things instead of making what they're there for even better for them so they stay longer. So we've got to end now. The book is so concise, so clear, and so specific on what each of us can do in so many different ways. Um, it's infrequent that I would say this, but in these kind of an events, I, I hope that 90, we get 90% sales here. And the only reason you don't is because somebody can't afford it, and then you're gonna get somebody else to do it for you. So go get this book. Thank you, guys.